Uh, good morning. Um, wherever you are, good morning. Uh, the uh, title today is Watchful, Thankful Prayer. And uh, our passage is in Colossians 4, uh, verse 2. So why don't we open in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much uh, for being our Heavenly Father, for being the one who allows us to come to you, who calls us to you, our Creator. Because of you, we can be heard when we cry out. So thank you of the promise you've given us in prayer. Thank you for the promises of salvation that we have in Jesus. Thank you also for the gift of the whole church, that we're not alone, but we can worship and pray together and lift each other up. Thank you for the true word of God in the Bible that you've given us so that we can know clearly what you say and know how to follow you. We ask that you please guide us right now in wisdom and in truth so that we can understand the word and see it bear fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, when the Apostle Paul wrote his book to the Colossian church, his letter, he wanted to help them navigate a several different threats to their spiritual lives. For one, a heresy had sprung up that locked salvation behind obedience to certain Old Testament laws and traditions. And there were also dangerous philosophies that undermined the gospel while sounding very impressive and intimidating. And most dangerous of all, there was a host of sins that were disrupting the unity and peace of the Christian church at Colossae, setting Christians against each other. Now, there was a lot of good in the church at Colossae, too. Paul says at the beginning that he thanks God because of their faith in Jesus has led them to love the rest of the saints. But the church was in danger. And against all these threats, what's the church supposed to do? Well, throughout the whole book, Paul gives a clear answer. We have the person of Jesus Christ through the gospel, and he is enough to overcome everything. But once we know this truth, what are we supposed to do with it? Well, in Colossians 4, 2, he tells them, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. This is a verse that I've meditated on a lot this year. Um, it pops up on my phone as a daily reminder, so that no matter what I'm doing or where I am, I can stop for a moment and just surrender my troubles and my fears to the Lord. I need this reminder. And so do you, because every day we are under siege from things that would seek to destroy our faith. Even when we come before the Lord, our hearts may not be in it. It's so easy to slip into thinking that you need to fix things on your own, whether in your life or in someone else's. Perhaps we tend towards complacency. That's being unwilling to work to improve a situation. Or maybe we wonder whether or not God will actually answer our prayers, or whether he intends to give us mercy or not. Well, no matter what you are dealing with, Colossians 4.2 is not an explanation that you have to struggle to understand, but a command. God tells us not to understand, but to obey. Obedience is where we must begin. It's God's character that we must trust in. And I think we can gain a lot of, a lot of peace from that. This verse reminds us to take both God's warnings and his promises seriously and to hold on to them so that no one will take them from us, all the while knowing that Christ is holding on to us and no one will take us from him. A healthy church must be filled with prayer. Continue steadfastly. That's what it says in the English Standard Version. Continue earnestly is what the New King James Version says. The NIV, it's rendered, um, devote yourselves to prayer. We can see that prayer is a habit, not, not just an event. It must be an integral part of our lives, not something that we just do occasionally as it suits us. Well, how do we do this? I want to address a possible concern or objection someone might have about this idea of continuous prayer. Is it possible to spend every waking moment on our knees speaking streams of heartfelt praises and requests to God? Must every social engagement also be a prayer meeting? Well, no, that, that's just not possible, and that's not even really desirable. Um, some men and women throughout church history have tried to do this. 
um, a mere 200 years after the crucifixion, some people were already moving into deserts to become hermits, monks, or nuns. And they all separated themselves from the world uh, so they could devote as much of their time as possible to prayer. Uh, they hoped to achieve a closer union with God through this. And I think if they really have a heart for prayer, I think that is good. But I don't think they quite understood exactly the way Christians are called to interact with the world uh, and with prayer itself. We're not to neglect our jobs and our families. We don't have to give up social interaction or even relaxation. We have very clearly given, uh, clear, clear God-given duties in all of these areas that don't necessarily involve stopping all activities, closing one's eyes, and directly addressing the Lord at every moment. God desires obedience, not a mere sacrifice of words. But if our time is so taken up with all these other things in our life, then how can we be continuous in prayer the way the Bible tells us to? Make it your attitude. Adopt a prayerful attitude in everything you do. Well, what's a prayerful attitude? I think one way of looking at it is that it is uh, an attitude that acknowledges that every moment of our life is lived in the sight of God. God's omniscient. He sees every action. He hears every thought. He lives every moment with us, his children. When a child's at home with, with her parents and he finds that she wants something, doesn't she call out to them without even a second thought as to whether they'll answer her? Many times the child doesn't even stop what she's doing. She just cries out, Mom, Dad, can I have such and such? Or where's the, the thing I want? Often it's something the child is perfectly capable of getting herself. But she still asks Mom and Dad to get it for her because she's used to their expressions of love, used to their care. Now, as a child gets older, you want to train her to... Uh, I learn personal responsibility to be able to do things on her own. It's natural, as children grow, they learn to be able to do the same things that their parents have been doing for them. But the gap between us and our Father in Heaven is far greater than the gap between us and our parents. We cannot do all the things that He does. So why should we make a continuous habit of prayer? Because we need the Lord's mercies all the time. And because he is our Father and because he, he gives us good things out of his love, we can come to him at all times, whether we're busy or not busy. Short prayers, as you're in the middle of another activity, are just as precious to God and as easily heard by him as the focused prayer of many hours by a mighty prayer warrior. What matters is the heart that is in the prayer, and a heart that loves God will always be seeking him. We can be continuously in prayer. It, it's a possible thing. While you drive, while you work, while you play, even while you're talking to someone else, your heart can be praying to the Lord, rejoicing in Him, asking Him for help, and thanking Him for all He has done. You don't even have to form clear words. Even the groaning of your heart is understood by God, if that's all you can manage. Now, if I ask God for something just once, and upon not seeing an immediate answer, I neglect to ask Him again, what do I prove? Perhaps that I'm insincere, that I don't really want the answer that I say I do. Or it may prove that I lack confidence in God. Does he really hear me? Does God really care to answer me? Is he capable of doing what I ask? These are terrible things to be thinking. Doubt yourself, but when you find yourself doubting God, I ask you, pray quickly for the Holy Spirit to help you through it. Cry out like the man in Mark 9, 24, when he said, I believe, but help my unbelief. That man didn't know how Jesus could help his son who was demon-possessed, but when Jesus told him, all things are possible for one who believes, the man was able to believe at least that much, just the fact that all things are possible through Jesus, even though he didn't know what kinds of things to expect. And Jesus did help him by healing his son just as he had asked. The disciples then asked Jesus why they had not been able to cast out the demon in his name as they had been trying to do before. And Jesus said in Mark 9, 29, this kind cannot be driven out but by prayer. Whatever the disciples had done when they were trying to cast out this demon, 
probably was not true prayer. But when the boy's father turned to Jesus, Jesus helped his unbelief. The man didn't have to do anything but ask. Jesus did it all. And that's what Jesus promises us when we turn to him and only him. Continue steadfastly in prayer. In both Matthew 7 and John 15, Jesus tells us, or tells us to ask of the Father in his name, and we will receive what we ask for. Now, this is a really hard lesson. Every one of us, I think, can name prayers that have not been answered the way we asked or in any way that we can see. There are prayers that I've lifted up to the Lord for over 20 years, my heart grieving and aching for a favorable answer. The answers I ask for seem like they should be exactly the sort that God is pleased to give, for peace, love, harmony, for soft and open hearts, for closeness to him and others. And yet for some of these, I've prayed for two-thirds of my life without seeing the mercies that I want. What does this mean? Well, there's at least one thing I can be sure of. Like that father of the demon-possessed boy, I do not know what God will do or when he will do it. I know my faith is weak. But I know that he has promised good to me and that I have nowhere else to turn but him. And when I cry to him to help my unbelief, he has always reminded me of his own goodness and power. I will be confident in him. So let us be diligent in prayer, both privately and as a church. When trials come, pray through them. Uh, Charles Spurgeon gave this illustration. He said that uh, a shipwrecked sailor clinging desperately to a rock offshore will yell and yell all through the night until help comes. And so should we pray for God's mercies until they come. Don't give up the cry. Or think of this. When we when we pray for someone else who is struggling or is unsaved, it's like they're the ones clinging to the rock in the sea, and we, the church, are in the rowboat going to rescue them. Each of our prayers is a pull on the oars, bringing God's mercies closer to the endangered soul. I have prayed for 20 years, and maybe I shall have to pray 20 more years for some of these things. But let us not drop the oars before we have reached our destination. It'll take more effort to pick them up again than it would have than it would have to simply take another pull. A pattern of prayer, once established, can be kept up with less effort than losing the pattern and trying to start again later. But if you do find yourself in a season without much prayer, as I think will happen to all of us throughout our lives, turn immediately back to Jesus and ask him to help you in your weakness. He is our king, and a good king equips his followers well for the battle. We are in a lifelong battle against sin, both in ourselves and in the world outside. We suffer persecution and tragedies, all of which are attacks on our faith in God in some way or another. But Jesus equips us for the fight. Look at the Armor of God passage in Ephesians 6. I'm not going to read all of it, but starting in verse 10, the apostle tells us how the gospel arms and armors us for our spiritual war. And then, if we go ahead to verse 17, he says, he writes that we will fight the good fight in all circumstances, and he says, praying at all times in the Spirit with prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Ephesians six, seventeen. At all times, pray in the Spirit. Not just when it's convenient, not just when you think you know how, and not only in public so that others can see and know that you're holy, and not only in private because maybe you're embarrassed that the hostile world will know of your faith, but pray at all times because prayer is how we advance on enemy ground in the war against sin and death. Keep up the fight. Show no mercy to these enemies. Pray for all the saints, your brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, your neighbors and strangers. Pray for those who are comfortable, that they will not be complacent. Pray for those who are suffering, that they will be comforted. And just as Ephesians 6, 17 tells us, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. 
Now the next part of Colossians 4.2 tells us to be watchful. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. In Ephesians, Peter, uh, Paul tells us to keep alert with all perseverance. And then here in Colossians, he says to be watchful in prayer. Well, to pray is to be on guard for whatever will come. A sentry is someone who stands watch to guard against the approach of the enemy. And a sentry who watches only briefly and then falls asleep or lets himself get distracted will not hold his post for very long. Uh, either the enemy will surprise and kill him and then continue on to attack his friends, or his master will find out that he's not diligent and will throw him out. The church must have diligent sentries to watch over her with steadfast, alert prayer. In the Old Testament, these sentries were often the prophets. They watched over the people of God in prayer, according themselves to the Holy Spirit, and they did not let up the watch. Um, the Lord says in uh, Isaiah chapter 62, verses 6 and 7, speaking of Jerusalem as uh, representing God's people, he says, On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen all the day and all the night. They shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest, and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise in the earth. Jerusalem here represents the church, waiting to be fully established and sanctified in God's presence. And how will the church come into its promised estate, into a kingdom full worthy of praise throughout the earth? It's through the prayer of those who day and night bring praises and requests for the good of the church before the Lord. Give him no rest, it says. Who are we to bang on God's door until he opens it? Well, we are those who obey him. Uh, he is the one who has set us up for this very purpose. God makes us all watchers over the church, and he commands us to call for his blessings until they come. When we do it, it shows our confidence in him. Remember, we are also his adopted children in, in Christ. God is glorified when we act according to our new natures as his children who delight in the gifts of their father. And he is pleased to give us good things. To be watchful is also to be aware. So we have a responsibility to pray in an informed, intelligent manner. Christians are not called to be ignorant of anything except the experience of sin. Everything else we must labor to learn that we may better obey the Lord. And that includes prayer. So watch that you don't grow callous or lazy in prayer. Now, myself, I struggle a lot with, with weariness when I pray. Uh, when I close the door of my room and I close my eyes to pray quietly, it's just not long before my mind begins to wander and my limbs grow heavy. I begin to pour out my heart to God, but before I can even finish the first request sometimes, my concentration might have flown away to somewhere completely different. And I have to pull myself back with great effort. Um, but I don't give up. When I catch myself doing this, I pray for the Lord to overcome my weakness. I pray for the Holy Spirit to wake me and keep me watchful. And I follow the prayer with practical efforts. Whatever works for you may be different than works for me. Sometimes I'll get up and do some jumping jacks or get something cold to drink or put on uh, some music that can, uh, won't put me to sleep but will still focus me on the Lord. Do the same yourself in whatever way you find uh, will help your prayer when you find it lacking. But pray for God to overcome your weaknesses and then look for the tools that he's already given you. Because I can assure you, the Lord knows what you will pray before you ask for it. He knows your needs. Nor should you be ignorant of your own sins. Examine yourself before the Lord, for if you're tolerating sin in your life, that will hinder your prayers. Uh, think of the way the author of Hebrews does. In Hebrews 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, a prayer is described as entering the holy places of God by the blood of Jesus, who represents us before the Father as our perfect high priest. And when we're in Jesus, we're like him, and we can draw near to God just as he does. And it says to, uh, in verse 22, in verse 22 it says, Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, 
with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That pure water at the end is baptism, which marks us as members of the kingdom of God. It symbolizes the cleansing from sin that we experience in Jesus. Now, even though God the Father already sees Christ's righteousness as our own, sin still lives in our flesh and has to be constantly fought and killed. It's here, but we can confess it and pray against it and by God's grace kill it. But if you know your sin and you're, you're not doing these things, you're not repenting of it or confessing it and fighting it, then how can you approach God, as Hebrews 10.22 says, with your heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience? This is not saying that you must be sinless in order to pray. We know that's not true. But don't give your enemy's sin a foothold to destroy your spiritual life. Seek out your sin, knowing it's there. Expose it so it can be killed. Be watchful against your sin. Now, after starting with yourself, I recommend you expand your circle of prayer. Pray for your family, considering all of their needs. Pray for your friends. Get to know your neighbors if you can, and pray for them too. Learn about the community where you live so, and, and where your church is, so that you can better pray both for the physical needs present as well as for the souls that need to be saved. Then look larger at our whole country. Do your best to understand what God desires for the nation and what the nation is most struggling with right now. And look outside your own communities. Look for the overlooked, the strangers and the foreigners, the widows and the orphans, the hungry and the tired, all of those whom the Lord especially calls us to serve in both the Old and the New Testament repeatedly. Wherever possible, establish relationships with people that allow you to know what they really need so you can better pray for them and with them and even Give them practical help should God give you the resources to be the answer to their prayers. And pray watchfully for the church. Every church is attacked by sin and the devil, whether they realize it or not. That absolutely includes our little congregation here, all of you. Where two or more are gathered in Jesus' name, there he promises to be. So we should make use of that promise and pray together in small groups and large groups, at home, at the building, for the health of our church. Pray for Pastor Paul, who works tirelessly and with great humility to serve us. Please pray for myself and the others who are working so fearfully on, on these sermons, and for all who are working to lead prayer, lead worship, lead Awana, and who are trying to find a way forward. Pray that we would all faithfully execute our responsibilities. Um, as a preacher, I see we have three great responsibilities, especially to confront people with the claims of Christ, to comfort those who are discomforted, and to make easy those to make uneasy those who are complacent in their lives and their faith. Well, I think anyone who is preaching benefits from the prayer of their congregation in order to uh, in order to do these things well. Preaching and leading can be very lonely jobs, and we crave your prayers. Your steadfast, watchful prayer will, I hope, help us feel less lonely. And your pleading before God for us may very well help defend us against our own sin, error, and foolishness. Um, right after our main verse in Colossians 4, now in verse 3, uh, the apostle immediately asks the Colossians to pray specifically for him and Timothy that their efforts to preach the gospel would be successful. Uh, just a little bit earlier, in Colossians 3, 16, the apostle tells them, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. This is that attitude of prayer that I mentioned earlier. Be watchful over each other in prayer. Not just privately praying for your friends, but even outside of the church service. Talk with each other. Pray with each other. When a fellow Christian who genuinely comes up to listen to your needs and help you pray, and helps you pray, um, that's like the spiritual equivalent of a warm hug. Uh, we need that for our encouragement, for our strength. It denies sin and the devil opportunities to drive us apart from each other and from Christ. 
After all, what's even stronger and better than one watchful sentry is a whole watchful camp behind him. And do not forget that the church is not only our congregation, but every other church out there which is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ as revealed in the scriptures. So keep the church at large in prayer, the church with a capital C. Be vigilant, praying over her, so that she may be a pure and faithful bride to the Lord Jesus. Pray for our missionaries, too, in every corner of the world who seek to make known Jesus so that souls may be saved and God's fame increased on the earth. And uh, one more point for this section. I think we should watch for the answers to our prayers. After all, when you send someone a letter, or maybe these days it's more often a text, don't you wait for a response? If you're texting, you kind of look for that little three dots you know, on the iPhone that tells you that someone's writing. If you ask for something of somebody, or you open your heart to them, but you don't even expect them to reply, doesn't that show that you don't have any confidence in them? Either you have no confidence in them, or maybe you don't even value the message you sent. So trust the, in the promises of Jesus. He told his disciples in John 15, verses 7 and 8, he says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you may bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So it glorifies God when we believe that he is answering our prayers. This is the way Jesus chooses for us to grow as his disciples. When a farmer plants a seed, doesn't he water it and watch for it to grow and bear fruit? So should it be with our prayer. Pray continuously, watching for the fruit of God's grace to come with us and to come to us. And that leads us to the last part of Colossians 4.2. It says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Of course, we have the holiday of Thanksgiving coming soon upon us. The whole country will be focused on the idea of being grateful for the blessings they have, which frankly is a pretty radical idea for our, uh, our society, which definitely tends towards selfishness and individualism. But what a wonderful opportunity this is for the Christian church to be an example before the whole world of real thankfulness. You know, Christians have more to give thanks for than anyone else. And I think even of the Christians who are suffering great persecutions, both now and throughout history, and how often in their testimonies they give thanks freely and more joyfully than, than I have many times. We have a God who hears prayers. Think of that. Our God actually hears and answers prayers. This sets us radically apart from all other religions and belief systems. Uh, just yesterday, I was reading the November newsletter from our missionary friends, Ted and Judy Olson. I think it's already posted back there. Um, it has a wonderful testimony of the work that God is doing. Uh, it tells there was a Hindu man named Jay living in the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. And he had a leg that was swollen, septic. It was causing him a lot of pain. And he didn't have money for a traditional doctor. So he paid what little he had for a Hindu holy man a traditional healer who came to him. The man prayed and he gave him some medicine that didn't work, didn't do anything. And he was desperate. He paid all his money to this guy. Uh, and he thought oh, it was worthless. These, these Hindu gods I've been praying to all my life, they don't do anything. Even when I get a holy man to come pray for me, they don't do anything. They can't. But then he heard that there were some Christians in a village nearby who would pray for anyone who came to them. So he went there and they prayed for him, and his leg was healed. And Jay and his family were converted to faith in Jesus Christ thereafter. Well, now that he saw the power of God, do you think Jay is now going to continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving? You bet. But how did the Lord draw Jay to him? Through Christians who were known to pray continuously for the needs of those around them and who believed in a Savior that answers prayers. Search the Bible for passages about prayer and you'll find much thanksgiving, much love and appreciation for what God has done. Just in our book of Colossians, the Apostle speaks of thanksgiving several times in what is really a pretty short book. 
He does this because he believes in God's goodness. It's both a past and a future goodness. We acknowledge what God's already done for us and the whole church in the past. But we also trust in the answers to prayers which we have yet to experience. Now, I confessed earlier some struggles I've had with seemingly unanswered prayer. I've prayed over a very long period for problems that still persist. These struggles aren't going to go away overnight. Maybe I'll fight them all my life. But just because I can't see the answers for my prayers yet does not mean that God is not good and faithful to his promises. When the Bible tells us to pray and ask of God, it also tells us to pray in Christ according to the Holy Spirit. This is a hard lesson I've been trying to come to, to, uh, to grapple with, but this means that it's possible for a Christian to pray wrongly. We must be watchful, not ignorant, about what God has promised us and what he has not. For example, he's not promised us a comfortable, peaceful life. If you pray for that, I don't think you're going to get it. Instead, we must study the word of God to learn what God promises to give us, and then pray according to that. For then we are guaranteed to receive what we pray for. He may not promise us a peaceful life in uh, worldly terms or comfortable life, but he will promise us peace in him. And this shouldn't be a disappointment to us. For who knows better what will make us truly healthy and happy? Ourselves, who can barely make good decisions throughout the day, and who are filled with sin and foolishness? Or our perfect loving creator, who loved us and chose us long before we were in the womb? God's plans for us are perfect, just as he is perfect. We can have confidence in God. In Isaiah 49, verse 16, God tells us, Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. I'm just in awe of that image. You know how some people who have trouble remembering things might write them in pen on their hands or their arms? Um, I, have, I, I did that not too much, but I had a lot of classmates in middle school and high school and college sometimes who would do that a lot. Um, well, God doesn't forget. And to show us that he doesn't forget or ignore us, he says that we're engraved permanently in the palms of his hands. We are we're that close to him. In the verse just before that, uh, verse 15 in Isaiah, in Isaiah 49, uh, he says that a woman is more likely to forget her nursing child and have no compassion on him than he, the Lord, is to forget you. So give thanks for that throughout every day. We have a God who hears our prayers and answers them. And he does so because he loves us. Because of the holiness we wear that was bought by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because of the Holy Spirit living within us to help us pray rightly, the Father in heaven will welcome us to live with him eternally. We live and pray in Christ, knowing that he will not refuse his own. So as we approach the holiday of Thanksgiving, uh, at the end of an extremely painful year. Let us remember the salvation we have in Jesus Christ. And let's show the fruit of our salvation in how we pray. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And if you will, you can turn with me to Psalm 100. It's a very short psalm. I want to end by reading it. Psalm 100 says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness, faithfulness to all generations. May you all know the Lord's blessings in abundance.